So when we see that, the statute, the image to be worshipped, now we want to see very clearly that there is a battle. And in Revelation 12, is going to increase as we go to Revelation 13, and there is a mark there. The mark of that government, that beast, is 666, which means failure upon failure upon failure. And it's on their forehead and on their hand. Many people like to think that it has to do with um, the computer. But on their forehead, it means knowledge and understanding of their choices. And on their hand, it means that they do. So they think and they do what they see. When you think about all these beautiful truths and you assimilate the knowledge, you will want to obey and do. And here is what this statute is representative as well because they know, they understand what they're doing and they do it in rebellion. Just like when um, Esau and Jacob and Cain and Abel, you always add one that will obey and one that is obeyed. This is the same principle here. There is one that is a doer and the other one who is undoing God's will and what God's want. So, now as we enter into Revelation 14 and we see fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made the heaven and the earth. This is what Lucifer has wanted from the beginning. Since he has been in heaven, he has been wanting to take the throne of God. And you can read that very easily in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. He wants the throne. He wants to sit in the place of God. He wants to sit in the midst of the congregation. He wants to sit in our mind and rule us. He wants to take over our will. And when Satan wants something, you better watch out. Because he will come out with all kind of tricks to try to really, really counterfeit everything. And it looks exactly like the genuine. We want to make sure we know the foundation of God's government, and we want to make sure we know the base of his authority, and we want to make sure we are sealed in that authority, and we have established that. We believe, according to the fourth commandment, that God's seal is in the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath day of the Lord thy God. Now, what is the authority of the Catholic Church? The Catholic Church has made a stand in the centuries, and you can read that in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. She has made a stand where she declares that the Catholic Church authority is based on Sunday. And if you want to read something interesting, go on the internet and punch him D.S. Domini. This is a letter that was written in 1998, presumably by the previous Pope, John Paul II, but we know from uh, literary background that the present Pope, pre uh, the Pope Benedict, which his name was Ratzinger, while he was a bishop or a cardinal, he's the one actually who has done this writing. And in it, it's very fascinating how you will see so many information regarding Sunday keeping and where it comes from. And we will discuss that in a few more session very very fascinating and very well covering their back the authority of the catholic church has to do with sunday sunday from way back into babel was the worshiping of the sun the day of the sun which has always been the main day of paganism and sunday keeping basically what you bring in is the worshiping of the sun it doesn't matter how it's brought about, whether it's brought under a Catholic or a Protestant type of a cloak or a pagan cloak, it is still the day of the sun. And it doesn't matter either, this is the interesting part, it doesn't matter either if the calendar is a bit shuffled as long as there is a day of the sun. Because the present calendar corresponds to nothing anyway. The Gregorian calendar does not correspond to the true biblical barley harvest law calendar, which brings in the first crescent new moon to correspond with agriculture on the earth. The Gregorian calendar comes from the Julian Roman calendar, which was actually de declared by the Senate. They were starting at first March, April, and then they changed it to January, the first as being the first of the year. It's totally man-made. 
and it, it is really behind schedule right now, actually. That's why they want to change it. So how will we see Babylon falling? The same principle as you see in this statute, by heating the feet, by heating the base, by heating the authority that makes it stand. And the authority of the Catholic Church is Sunday keeping. Now, that's fine and dandy. That's easy to say. How are we going to do it? This is how we're going to do it. Is we're going to hit the Catholic Church at its foundation by heeding Sunday keeping. Well, another question I have to ask you. Who and what brings us with a Sunday keeping church? What brought the Sunday keeping church? Because we know that from the time of Christ with the Apostle and until about the decree of Nicaea in 325 AD, there were many Christians that kept the feast of Passover. You can read it in the book of A.T. Jones, The Two Republic, and the book of Prophetic Faith of Our Father, and even in the writing of Sister White, and many of the writing here of the Great Samadon Collection, you know that, that people in the time of Christ never kept Sunday day, especially Christian people and Jewish people. So what brought about that Sunday became the day for the Christian as well as the pagan? Well, we should all know this, that it was actually paganism mingling with Christianity and enforcing a Sunday keeping based on Resurrection Day. Where the idea came from and from who, I have not done that research. If you know the answer, you may want to contact me. But the idea came that Christ was resurrected on Sunday, so we're going to start keeping Sunday as the day of the Lord. And so, basically, when you see the foundation of Sunday keeping, Sunday keeping is directly connected with Christ's resurrection. And Christ's resurrection, according to the Catholic Church, it is claimed that Christ's resurrection was April 3rd, 3380, or AD 33. Well, if you check that, which is supposed to be a Sunday, To come up with that date, now that we know better with the Bali Harvest calendar, we know that, first of all, it does not meet the requirement of the Bali Harvest because it cannot be that the Bali was ready. The, red, the Bali is not ready until the 8th of April in Israel. So basically, we can see that the Passover, remember, this is not Passover for the Catholic Church. Easter is not Passover. This is actually the Resurrection Day, so that would be first fruit. So Passover would be three days before that, which would be a Friday, if that is Sunday. So the third, the second, and the first would be April 1st. Passover can never be April 1st, since the barley is not ripe until about the 8th in Israel. So basically, this is way too early to have a Passover, Easter weekend, if you like to call it this way. Well, let me name again my the, Pas the, the, the Feast of the Lord. So the first one is Passover. The second one is Unleavened Bread. So we know that from previous study. The third one is First Fruit. Okay. Now, the fourth one would be Pentecost. So we have them here. Those are the spring feast. And then, of course, we have in the fall feast, trumpet. I'll just put them short here. Day of Atonement. Then we have tabernacle. And we have two days of tabernacle here. Now let me show you something fascinating. It's really, when you think about it, Easter does not correspond to Passover. Easter corresponds to first fruit. It's resurrection day. Passover would be Good Friday, and of course, unleavened bread, which is a Sabbath, is not really thought about by the Catholic Church. You don't teach that Saturday between Good Friday and um, Easter. And then Pentecost usually is celebrated in the Catholic Church, but it's not calculated after the new moon properly, so the 50 days doesn't really fall on the right time. It's always a Sunday, as according to the Catholic Church. So basically, you have Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruit, and Pentecost that are basically counterfeited. 
Then you have trumpet in the fall, day of atonement, and tabernacle, which does not correspond to any of the feasts of the Catholic Church. You may have uh, Thanksgiving, you may have uh, Christmas, you may have New Year's, you may have uh, Immaculate Conception, but these don't correspond to the fall feast. So not only, look how cunning that is, not only Sabbath has been changed for Sunday, but the feasts of the Lord also have been counterfeited where you cannot even find Passover anymore. And they never mention first fruit, never. First fruit is not mentioned that way, it's Easter. And we know that Easter has to do with gods, pagan gods. It has nothing to do with uh, Passover. Either way, we can check it out and see that it does not correspond to the barley harvest law. And we can prove it through the prophecy of Daniel 8 and 9, biblically, astronomically, chronologically, and historically. Christ did die in the midst of the week in 3180. And as we're going to see a little bit later on, we're going to figure out the day that he died, and it is not on a Friday. And we know from these Arab ages that we're told that every event connected with the death of Christ, we need to understand them. And we are told also that there is definitely some important message in the crucifixion that we should know. But before going to the crucifixion time, I would like now to explain to you something that we will need to understand in order to maybe not so much put the dates together, but put the events together. So here we have the image to the statute that Nebuchadnezzar enforced to be worshipped, which was made out of gold. Here we have the big stone that comes and hits the statue to the feet, to its authority, to its power, and it's crumbling into pieces. I believe this is such an object lesson for us to take heed that if an enemy knows the weakness of the battlefield when it goes to the enemy's battlefield, that's where it is going to hit. If you know the weakness, this is where it's going to hit. So basically, we know the weakness of the statute was the feet of clay and iron, and the rock came and hit it and basically totally destroyed it and crumbled it, and then the kingdom of God could be established. So when we have understood that, it would be well to take heed that as we know the authority of the Catholic Church is Sunday keeping based on the Sunday crucifixion, we are prepared now to face whatever we can to really show that Babylon is fallen. So now what I'd like to do is I'd like to go into the book that is really a guidance for me as well with the crucifixion, and we're going to start now another part of Babylon is Fallen by looking at the time of Gethsemane, very important details, in the chapter of Gethsemane and the chapter also of the Calvary. So if you want to turn with me, if you have your Desire of Ages, I invite you to turn to chapter 74, and you can verify it for yourself, page 685. And what I'd like to do right now is I'd like to compare Passover with Passover of the New Testament. Passover of the Old Testament, Passover of the New Testament. We have to be clear as to when is Passover taking place. And then that will establish in the calendar again where we can prove when Passover happened in 31 AD. And we're told that we can know these things. We can actually claim these things that they are for us to understand that Passover and um, unleavened bread and first fruit, they have happened at a date that is in history. And we know too that most theologians right now, it's a challenge because most theologians do not know when the day of the crucifixion.